Thank you for joining us for this evening's program, Beyond Borders, the Map of the Salish Sea, presented by Stefan Freeland. Before we get started, I have a few pieces of housekeeping information to share. First, your cameras and microphones are turned off and will remain so throughout the program. Please put your questions and comments into the chat window. Only program hosts will be able to see your messages in the chat. From the chat, we'll gather questions to share with our presenter at the end of the program for a Q&A. We'll get to as many of your questions as possible. We, can, we will also use the chat to share out links and information with you. Second, closed captioning is available during this presentation. It can be enabled by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And last, this event is being recorded, and the event will be on uh, the Snow Isle Library's YouTube channel several days after this live broadcast. At this point, I'd like to now introduce Stefan Freeland. Stefan is a GIS specialist and instructor at the College of the Environment at Western Washington University. In addition to teaching GIS, cartography, and GPS, he assists with academic research projects and is co-director of the Institute for Spatial Information and Analysis. He has a Master of Science in Geography and a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Ethics. Thank you, Stefan, for joining us this evening. I will turn the floor over to you. Great, thanks. And I just, I'll try to not focus on, on the chat, but I just saw the chat float by of what is GIS? And that's a great opening question. Uh, so GIS is Geographic Information Systems. And basically that is a computer program for doing mapping and spatial analysis. Pretty much it's what geographers have been doing forever. Uh, we just do it now on a computer and the software is GIS, Geographic Information Systems. So, um, so hi, I'm Stefan, and uh, I do GIS, among other things. Uh, mostly I'm going to talk about cartography tonight, as opposed to as a subset of GIS, and uh, the map of the Salish Sea that I had the good fortune to get wrangled into uh, 12 years ago or so. And, um, and we're going to talk about maps. I hope you like maps, because that's uh, we're going to look at a lot of maps. Uh, and so let's, let's take a look at what, what we've got here. Um, that should be live. Yes, someone will tell me if not. Um, so, hi, Stefan Freeland, and uh, this is the map of the Salish Sea. This is actually a revised version, and I'll talk about the earlier version. Uh, and uh, thank you to the Snow Owl Libraries for hosting me and all of you for showing up. Uh, and like I say, I hope you like maps. So, uh, what is GIS? We got that out of the way. Now let's talk about what is the Salish Sea. My hope is that, my assumption, many, maybe most of you, uh, as residents of the Salish Sea uh, bioregion, We'd have a pretty good idea, um, but uh, let, let's, let's, let's make it explicit. Uh, the Salish Sea is the inland marine waters of British Columbia and Washington State. So that area contained by uh, Cape Flattery out the west end of Strait of Juan de Fuca, the northern end of the Strait of Georgia, up to Johnstone Strait, down to Olympia, over to Everett kind of thing. So it's that, that inland marine waters. Uh, which is uh, a kind of unusual thing in the world, I, I think, and a, a really great place to spend some time. Now, one of the interesting features uh, about that uh, body of water is that it has an international border going right through the middle of it, and that makes things much more challenging, much more interesting, um, as we will discuss here uh, momentarily. The the Salish Sea can also be con can be defined, described as the sum of its parts. So you've got the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Strait of Georgia, Puget Sound, Desolation Sound. Uh, and then there's this sort of this middle area that doesn't quite have a name yet. Uh, the San Juan Islands, the Southern Gulf Islands. Um, I like to refer to this as the Central Salish Sea, but that's still uh, that's still kind of just me. I'm, I'm working on that in terms of getting another name adopted, at least into the local vocabulary. So I, I offer that to you all as well. So geographers, cartographers, we like to put these lines in the map of saying, well, this is the this is the Strait of Juan de Fuca, this is the Strait of Georgia. It's a little bit hard to to see see that when you're actually out there in a boat. Um, so here, this is a satellite image of the uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca coming into Whidbey Island there. Uh, a perfect shot for the Snow Isle Library's audience. Uh, north is now to, to off to the side, and we're looking at, you've got Bellingham, Vancouver, Victoria, Seattle. So um, that water comes in there. One can draw a line across Admiralty Inlet and say that's the Puget Sound. That's relatively uh, concrete uh, in terms of, of drawing a, a line across the water. Um, it's a lot less 
precise and a lot more wishy-washy, uh, literally, uh, in terms of where the Salish Sea, or excuse me, where the Strait of Juan de Fuca ends and where the San Juan Islands or the Strait of Georgia would, would begin. Um, and of course, the water, the fish, and or a potential oil spill don't really pay any attention to these these borders. These are arbitrary. We humans like to put the lines on maps, but uh, the water doesn't care. Um, so looking at those those pieces, again, fairly easy to, to define Puget Sound uh, across that inlet, the narrow, the narrow, where does Strait of Georgia end and where does Strait of Juan de Fuca end? And, and even out to the west side uh, by Cape Flattery, is that a curved line or a straight line or a plume? And if it's a straight line, does it go north or the shortest distance? And so these are the kinds of questions that, that no one much cares about except for a few geographers and cartographers, but I spent a lot of time thinking about. So uh, the narrow definition or the simple is that the inland waters, British Columbia uh, and Washington State, the inland marine waters there, they're shared transborder uh, and as a as an entity, the name the Salish Sea was formally adopted by various governments in 2009, 2010. So um, we're now on the other side of what was a uh, conscious naming campaign, successful naming campaign that I was thrilled to be a part of. Now, in some sense, the as part of that campaign, I was asked to produce a map of the Salish Sea. And in some sense, this map is the map they wanted. And all I need to do is put uh, a title on there called Salish Sea when we're done. Um, but from the get-go, I felt like the Salish Sea as a place was uh, was worth more than just this map here, and, and that I wanted to try to uh, produce something that at least I thought was beautiful, and maybe other people would want to hang on the wall as well, uh, and uh, in some small sense, try to capture the feeling of this place that we call home. So let's talk about Salish Sea a little bit by the numbers. 17,000 square kilometers, 6,000 square miles. Um, it's got some pretty deep water for not a huge body, not not super large. Up in Butte Inlet, we get down to 600 meters. Got Mount Rainier, so pretty high. We've got a whole bunch of rivers, depending on your definition of river. 20 glaciers. Uh, hope, hopefully, we can keep those around for a while. Uh, and a whole bunch of islands, again, depending on your definition of an island. Um, a lot of critters. Uh, that, that intermixing of rivers and marine water uh, and islands and coast make for good places for fish and plankton and birds. Uh, and we've got a bunch of them, uh, a lot of invertebrates, 3,000 species of invertebrates, uh, and even a couple of uh, reptiles, uh, sea turtles out there, the uh, green sea turtle and the leatherback. Um, that's all great news. That's We all love those. That's part of the reason we're here. The flip of that is that it's not all good news out there. And then there's a number of those species at risk, especially as you go up the food chain almost half of the marine mammals. Uh, we're not gonna, I'm not going to dwell too much on that other than it's that kind of concern that drove the initial idea, suggestion, thought to we need a name for this thing we're trying to, to protect, uh, that name being now the Salish Sea. Um, the, to a large extent, why those species are at risk is because of this number. And this number is 9 million people that uh, are living in the immediate surrounding basin around the the uh the sailor sea half of those uh are living around puget sound so that's the concentration of people it's not the biggest part of the 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 water the sailor sea by any means relatively small but you've got a lot of people down there people have impact um you also have 60 plus sovereign nations in the first nations and 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 tribes of the u.s side um you've got a lot of people and a lot of people bring a lot of boats and the boats among other things bring oil tankers and coal trains, um, but to a lesser extent, cars and the, just the runoff of cars and tires. And, and we humans have an impact um, just by being here. Um, they did a study out in Harrow Strait uh, and found that the average sound volume out there was 100 decibels, which is pretty loud and uh, challenging for a, a species to do what it wants to do out there. Um, and uh, here's another little map that I find a little like, oh my gosh. Um, so over 100 wastewater treatment discharge sites uh, in the Salish Sea. So this is water, you know, has been treated, we hope, well, um, but it's not the same as fresh water. It, 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 you know, it, it, it has an impact. Okay, so this is the concern that is uh, rolling around uh, in the back of, of many people's minds. And as a, as a large body of water, 
there are a lot of jurisdictions, a lot, like over a hundred different government entities have some say in the management and the rule setting and the controls of the, the Salish Sea. You've got First Nations, you've got federal government, state and provincial, you've got departments of natural resources on both sides of the border. You've got city, ports, Nanaimo, Everett, et cetera, et cetera, counties, on and on and on. And then you've got dozens more of nonprofits and citizen groups. So just a phenomenally complex, uh, overlapping jurisdictions, overlapping uh, goals and mandates, um, you know, every, you know, everything from Greenpeace to the to the Coast Guard and the military. Um, and through all of this, you have the this international border, which, again, the fish don't care, but boy, the people sure do. So the managing, you know, it, it doesn't do any good for one group to really, I mean, it does some good, but it doesn't do much good if one group really cleans up their wastewater treatment if their next door neighbor is not doing as good or better a job. So it, it's it was the, this goal of trying to unite you know, all these, there's this hodgepodge of overlapping uh, of entities, stakeholders when it comes to meetings, to somehow get them all on the same page. And the very beginning first step, it seemed like, was to have a single common name. And so that was what, that's what this, this gentleman, Bert Weber, uh, one of my mentors, uh, and uh, Bert was a faculty at uh College of the Environment up at Western, still around, still very involved in marine science. He was a marine scientist, um, came from Canada. So he has a trans-border life story right there in his own personal trajectory. Um, and he studied estuaries and uh, he studied the Salish Sea and he was concerned about the health of the Salish Sea. Uh, and he felt that if we had a single unifying name, that would be a good first step. That would, that would help in getting all those different jurisdictions to come to the same table and, and maybe come to the same some of the same decisions, um, and so he made a formal proposal in 1988 uh, to that he came up with this idea, the Sailor Sea. Thought that was a good name, and he proposed it, and it didn't really go very far. Uh, it, it was not accepted. They uh, they said, "Thank you for thank you for your time," and um, so good idea. Gave it the old college try. Um, in terms of where he got that name, the word Salish um, is is uh, it is not a traditional native term, right? This, the word Salish is a European word. It was uh, the European anthropologists, explorers uh, used the word Salish to describe a large language group, the Salishan language group, uh, of which our area is would be a subset of that, the Coast Salish group. Um, so while it, it certainly has... Um, uh, you know, it, it has that clear association with the indigenous cultures. It is not a, a traditional word in, in per se. Weirdly, I don't think this is particularly conscious, and weirdly that worked out very well for the, the ultimate adoption of the term, in that there's 60 different tribes, different, different groups, um, with lots of different names for the same, you know, so, you know, again, if you, if, what, what one group calls it, so, so the word Salish was not a Skagit word or a Lummi word or a Nooksack word, and thus it was uh, less controversial and acceptable to all. Uh, and again, it clearly has this, this association with the, the larger group. Uh, and the term was um, adopted favorably by, many, you know, by the Coast Salish gatherings and many of the, the tribal groups, which helped its uh, eventual adoption. So... Um, there's a lot about Bert and Bert's story. This, I, I'm not here to tell Bert's story, but if you're interested in some of Bert's and where he came up with that name and that, especially that first uh, iteration of the proposal, um, there's articles and interviews, and um, I'm happy to try to steer you towards uh, Bert Bert's story uh, as a as a as a side. And mine's a corollary, a, 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 a part of the larger story, as as is Bert's. So Bert was concerned about his this estuary, our estuary. Um, what is the estuary? Estuary is a, a semi-enclosed body of salt water that has a relatively uh, significant contribution to fresh water. And it's this mi mixing of the fresh and the salt water that makes it brackish uh, and tends to be very rich in biodiversity and, uh, and food. Uh, and so where you get a lot of this mixing and mingling and these islands and this, all this stuff, you get plankton and then you get fish and then you get birds and you get mammals. Uh, again, it, it's, it makes for a really beautiful place, as we all know. The estuaries are also, by their very nature, 
rather vulnerable. So if you dumped the Fraser, it, the Columbia River dumps into the Pacific Ocean and just dissipates into the salt water fairly rapidly. The Fraser River, and this the satellite image here, you can see that plume of the Fraser River uh, comes out and mixes with the salt water in the Salish Sea, and it hangs around for a long time. It takes quite a while for that to get out. So the salt water, the, the salt water concentration in the Salish Sea is less by almost a you know half a percentage you know point from um, the Pacific because of this freshwater input and that mixing and that freshwater makes for again food. Now that same containment is a vulnerability, which is to say if you happen to have something less favorable than fresh water from the Fraser River, but something like an oil spill, you have that 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 lack of flushing that that makes their estuary an estuary also makes it vulnerable. Okay, that this is what was driving Burke. So a, a quick side, sort of a diversion here into talking about the Fraser River, because I think this is fascinating. The barge, the uh, the, the chart, line chart here is the, the different rivers in the Salish Sea, the major rivers dumping into the Salish Sea, and that big lump in the middle, that's the Fraser River. So if you add up all the other rivers, you know, you, I live near the Nooksack, and you live on the Skagit and the Snohomish, those are some pretty good-sized rivers. Um, you add up all of them, the total combined inflow into the Salish Sea from all those rivers is about half of what the Fraser does. The Fraser is way over half of the total, almost two thirds of the total input. Phenomenal uh, volume of fresh water coming into and creating this estuary. And indeed, that Fraser River drives the entire circulation model of the Salish Sea. It's such a dominant player uh, the, in, in the volume and the, the, in the just the, that that current coming off the off the shore there. Um, we you see that up and down the Salish Sea quite a ways south. Okay, I, I just love this 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 that picture there. So that's what makes an estuary, and estuaries are are good. We like them, uh, and, and they're at risk, uh, and they're disappearing. They did a study comparing you know estuaries from 1850s to now, and we've lost in Washington State something like 85 percent of the natural estuaries. Where did they go? What happened? Um, we did that. Uh, we filled them in, and we put marinas and landfill and houses and resorts and on and on and on and uh, put banks up there and dredged areas. We filled in some areas and dredged in the others. Um, it's not universal. It's not even. There are some, uh, some estuaries. Birch Bay lost 90%. That chart on the right is showing uh, the, the bar charts, uh, the, the large bars are how much has been lost. And so uh, some of those estuaries lost 80, 90% of their, their area. Some of them were like only 10 or 20%, but a lot of them have been gone and, and very, very difficult to get them back. Um, and so, again, from Bert's standpoint, many of us agree, worth preserving, and that's before you add the layer of sea level rise. And so if that water table goes up, um, where is that going to have the, the biggest impact? Of course, is going to be the near shore, which is to say the estuaries, the wetlands. Are, are There's, there's a, a new risk that, that was uh, not unheard of, but it wasn't what Bert was thinking about in the 80s when he first came up with this idea. What he was thinking about was oil spills. Um, and uh, 89, so shortly after his proposal, um, many people's worst fears uh, was actualized here in the Exxon Valdez. Um, that red circle up there is where this, this, the ship ran aground, dumps out 10 million gallons of oil, covers you know thousands of kilometers of shoreline. Um, the, the worst area was this stretch of 600 or so kilometers. Um, that almost uh, completely covered in oil. Uh, and if you look at a, a same a map of the Salish Sea, where we get some 13, 1,300 tankers a year, many of them with oil and chemicals, um, here's that same circle there. We used to say from the south end of the Salish Sea to the north end is about 600 kilometers. If you put a similar oil spill into the Salish Sea, you pretty much uh, wall to wall oil cover the carpet the entire water body. Um, and it does not flush out very quickly. Um, one of the things I think is fascinating about this map of the Exxon Valdez, notice Cook Inlet up here. So Cook Inlet, which is an estuary, uh, semi-contained, notice how little oil made it into Cook Inlet, all right? There was lots of oil and the oil basically goes right past, which shows you how little water goes in and out of an estuary. It stays there and gradually seeps in and out. Um, that protected Cook Inlet from being decimated by oil. That was a good thing. But on the other hand, if that Exxon Valdez had 
run aground inside of the Cook Inlet, it would have you know been far you know even worse um, in terms of this heavy concentration. And and again, they just don't flush out very much. So th it was this concern that was driving Bert's proposal, pre Valdez, but 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 the same basic you know plenty of plenty of reason to be concerned. So Bert felt like we needed a name. They, he felt like estuaries and islands and birds and fish are fragile. They're worth protecting. We have this challenge of multi-overlapping jurisdictions. Uh, and the minimum, you know, the, 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 the least we could do is have a common name. So we have some you know, way of talking about it, transborder. So let's do that. And how do you do that? Well, it turns out that there are geographic names and uh, geographic naming boards. And so you have in BC and Washington and Canada and USA, you have these boards that sit down and they talk about what a name should be. And the process is amazingly democratic and grassroots. And it basically boils down to this. They look for evidence. And if people on the ground are using this, if they're using this word as a name, then it's a name, right? Um, it, it's a, a wonderfully, uh, we just look to the people. Um, now, some of them are more controversial. This is Denali. That was a big deal. And it was a renaming. Uh, that's that's a, a uh, inherently a, a more challenging and controversial topic, um, but by and large, it's not a big deal. And uh, they look to schools and museums and people and indigenous tribes. Um, and so the increasingly, there a lot of what geographic naming boards is doing are sort of renaming, going back to reverting to earlier names. And so there's a, an effort towards, um, anyway, Denali. So, um, so that's that's where the proposal is. You, you make your proposal to there, and they consider it based on the evidence they can find. So Burke proposes the Salish Sea, and they come back a year later and say, mm, yeah, well, maybe not. Um, they didn't flat out deny it, which is very lucky. If they had just said no, it's hard to appeal. But instead, they tabled it. They basically said, maybe. Let's think about it. Not enough evidence right now. It seems a little bit experimental. Um, and that left the door open just a crack. For a, a future uh, a future reapplication. Now, I like to think personally that if they just had a better map back in the '80s, it might have gone through on the first time. But that's just that's just my supposition. So, Burt, you know, again, he'd given it a college try. Um, shortly thereafter, he retired from the university. Um, this is his what was his the, the Snow Goose, his, which is his boat he captained, uh, uh, doing uh, educational ecotourism up in Alaska. I think he sort of said, you know, had given it a good shot, but he wasn't going to lose a whole lot of sleep over it, right? You, you try, you win some, you lose some. And so he heads off to Alaska, and a funny thing happens while he's out and about on, on the Snow Goose, and that is that the name actually was a good idea, and it did catch hold, and uh, increasingly at that grassroots level. And most notably among the resource managers, which is to say the indigenous state and, and provincial uh, forest managers, the scientists at the university, and the locals, started, they liked that term. It was a good idea. And it, and it did help describe, you didn't have to say the Puget Sound and the Salish Sea, and the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Strait of Georgia and the, 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 this middle section. You could just say the Salish Sea. Um, I first came across it out in the San Juan Islands, you know, in the early 90s and thought, what a great idea. We're, you know, that also has that nice alliteration of the Salish Sea. Uh, uh, and again, the, the tip of the hat towards the, the, uh, the indigenous tribes, uh, First Nations. So I think it was a good idea, and lots of people did like it, even though the naming board didn't quite go full in quite yet. So time passes, and um, there's a, a gradual effort to try again. And um, I like the sort of full circle here in that the first time it was sort of Bert's idea and Bert trying to get everybody else on board, it didn't work. Bert goes about his way. And the second one was more the community saying, hey, let's try this again, and and trying to get Burt back in to be involved as, as, as because of his earlier. Um, and notably, one of the notable communities here was the Coast Salish Gathering. And so that that that, that support from numerous Coast Salish uh, organizations um, gave a certain weight and, and, and some, uh, I think, important momentum at, at a critical time. So there was a much more concerted second round, second effort, um, and uh, sort of lessons learned what went wrong the first time. We want to, you know, get the word out. We want to document everything we can, um, so that, that in in the hopes of being more successful. Uh, again, a more concerted effort as a propaganda campaign. The second time, it's about the first one is just sort of Bert saying, "Hey, I got a good idea." 
So we looked at what went wrong the first time, and there were there was resistance. There's always resistance to, any, to anything you do, and um, it, it found in sort of three categories. Um, the first was the fear that the Sailor Sea was going to replace existing names. The second one was that it was just unnecessary and expensive, and the third concern was that the Sailor Sea doesn't qualify as a sea. So I want to briefly touch on all these. The first uh, is a really a non-issue, but it's an understandably con point of confusion. Um, the Salish Sea was never intended to replace anything. It was an umbrella term. So unlike Denali or Haida Gwaii, which replaced the name for the Queen Charlotte's, those are controversial because somebody had to, you know, somebody was now changing their address. Salish Sea, not that at all. And so in the, the making of the map, it was a big deal when we made, when I made the map of the Salish Sea for Bert and we handed out, handed this out, that we wanted to have the Strait of Juan de Fuca Strait of Georgia, Puget Sound, Desolation Sound, right there on the map of the Salish Sea. So there could be no confusion. No one, we're not trying to to, to take away anyone's name. And I remember that, you know, letters to the editors, you know, by gosh, I grew up in the Puget Sound and no one's going to tell me it's not the Puget Sound. And we totally agree that like, you're absolutely right. It's a, Puget Sound is a good name and I'm glad you live there. Um, so, and in the remaking of the map, um, still the same, you know, still keeping the San Juans and the Gulf Islands, those place names are important. And that's important to me as a cartographer. That that's uh, I, I don't want to lose those. So that's a non-issue, an understandable point of confusion. But part of the campaign has been always to overcome that perceived uh, issue. There's also an issue that it's expensive, uh, unnecessary. Um, you'd have to remake all the old maps, um, and uh, and actually no, you don't have to you don't have to remake any old map because if the old map said Puget Sound and it's still Puget Sound, there's nothing wrong with the old map. Uh, and I think that the ship captains are going to find Everett just fine with their GPS, to, regardless of what you would call the Sailor Sea. Um, and to the point of uh, we just don't even, you know, there's better things to spend our time and our money on. We really don't need another name. Um, it's always been this way kind of thing. Um, it hasn't always been this way. So um, 1800s, we don't, it's hard to go back in history, but we can at least go back into the 1800s. Um, the original proposal from Vancouver, Vancouver called this whole thing, basically the Sailor Sea, the Gulf of Georgia. Pretty nice name. And it has that alliteration, the Gulf of Georgia, like the Sailor Sea. Um, so um, didn't didn't stick for whatever reason, but uh, but there wasn't, you know, uh, it wasn't always this way. And um, in the 50s, there was a proposal for the Western Sea. Notable that they used the word sea there. Um, and again, what's the difference between a Gulf and a sea? It's hard to say. Uh, a lot of overlap here. Um, uh, the Georgia Depression, not a real catchy term there. A lot of things of the Strait of Georgia Puget Sound, Strait of Juan de Fuca, the Georgia Puget Basin, um, Ish River. I'll come back to the Ish River Sound later. Um, at least in my world, the most common proposal is, has been the Greater Puget Sound, um, which you know I, I really dig my heels in on this one. Um, Puget Sound is clearly defined as a body of water. It crosses at the Admiralty Inlet. Um, traditionally, the sailor, or the Puget Sound was only that area down south of the Toman Arrows. All right, so uh, Bert refers to this as, as Puget Creek. That it started out way down in the south. It's now gone up to Admiral Inlet, and there's some people uh, thinking that they're going to take Puget Sound all the way up to uh, you know Campbell River, uh, and uh, I, I certainly hope not. So. Um, I think none of these really, yeah, clearly none of these really worked, uh, and they're clunky. Uh, uh, yeah, but but they do illustrate that there is a need, a desire for a common name. Um, we, we've been circling around this for a while, trying to come up with something. Um, the third part of resistance was um, maybe legitimate, kind of harder to answer, but that the, the this body of water was didn't qualify. It was too small, too many outlets. Um, it, it opens up the question of well, what is a sea? Um, and so seas, there's a wide range out there in terms of what is a sea. Um, the Philippine Sea, 5,000 square kilometers, uh, Maramara Sea, uh, 11,000. And again, the Sailor Sea is 17. So sure, the Sailor Sea is on the small end, but there's plenty of seas out there that are smaller. Um, Lake Ontario, well, bigger than the Sailor Sea, uh, and that's not even the largest of the Great Lakes. Um, but the biggest bay we have in the United States is Chesapeake Bay. It's smaller than the Sailor Sea. So, you know, if you think of bays as being smaller than seas, that works. Until you think about Hudson Bay, which is a million square kilometers. So um, basically all over the map, quite literally. And you have inland seas and uh, marginal seas and 
okay, let's go to the dictionary. What does the dictionary say? Dictionary says a body of salt water of second rank, more or less landlocked. Oh, that's that's pretty specific. Um, relatively large body, body completely or partially enclosed, uh, relatively landlocked, sometimes freshwater. Um, so uh, not surprisingly little help from the dictionaries and, uh, and a phenomenally high degree of overlap between what we say is a, a, a sea, a bay, a gulf, a sound, a channel, an ocean, um, whatever the seven seas are, we don't know what, we don't even know what a sea is. Um, kind of, kind of no help there either. Um, so and I, went, I went down this rabbit hole and spent, you know, charting out, looking at other map examples of seas around the world and how big they were. And do they have one inlet or two and uh, sub sea, you know, blah, blah, blah. How contained does it have to be? And, um, what I really came to, uh, in the, in the final analysis of what is a sea or, or not a sea, things that have the word sea in their name. And that sounds like a little bit of a snarky answer, I know, but it's actually, that is the best definition for what is a sea that I can come up with. Um, and it, it speaks to the, the wisdom of those geographic naming boards. Um, it's not like we sat down 2,000 years ago and named all everything on the planet. It's that like we humans have been naming things as we go and as we find them, as we think about it. And once there's a name, so, so the name is more important than the definition, right? Uh, and so basically from all that, the Salish Sea qualifies. There's plenty of examples of smaller or different. There's nothing, you, you, you cannot disqualify the Salish Sea on any grounds that I could find. And I've got maps to, to talk about it. Um, so that was reassuring. Uh, at least, at least, at least we're in the right. You know that that word can work. Now, while we are at it, we tried to de define island. Um, the number four hundred is often often tossed, tossed about in terms of four hundred islands in the Salish Sea. Um, could be double that, depending on what you, how you define an island. Um, high tide or low tide? Does it have to have a name? Does it have to be, uh, you know, is that vegetation uh, populated uh, or not populated? Um, when you get into a mudflat, uh, is that one island or 25 islands? Uh, or, and it keeps changing. And how far up the river do you go in the mudflat? And uh, is, you know, Fidalgo an island or not? All these uh, issues and questions. I, as a young geographer, thought, well, I'll just go to the State Department of Natural Resources and I'll get the definition that Washington State uses for what is an island. And lo and behold, and I, I went, I did, I emailed and, and, and no one, there, there is no such thing. We don't have a definition for an island. It kind of comes down, I and mean, we all know what an island is, but if you want a definition of this is an island and that's a rock, it doesn't exist. And if it did exist, it'd be different for BC versus Washington versus Canada. All right, so um, different purposes, different definitions. Um, similar for rivers, um, that when you come down there, you know, a river versus a stream versus a creek, and things that we scoff at as just barely a, a stream around here are bigger than rivers in other parts of the world. Um, so... A lot of context and a lot of, uh, you know, is, is it, what is it, what it, what do you have to be? What's the threshold to be a river? Is it water flow year round? Does it have to have a fish, perennial, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as a, so I, I'm, I'm going down this, this, this path. I'm kind of scratching my head. I go back to Bert and he's like, Bert, you know, can't even find a definition for a sea, let alone an island or a river. There's no maps out there with Sailor Sea on it. You know, what's going on here? And, uh, and Bert's like, yeah, I know we need a map. Uh, we need a map of the area. And so we go looking for maps. And um, I guess that begs the question of, well, what is a map? So real quickly, a map is a two-dimensional uh, scaled depiction of geographic space. We're not talking about mental maps or Mars or part of the Earth here. Um, but pretty much static, again, paper flat map. Um, I like this map here. This is a map of the um, uh, Black Ball Ferry up in, up in BC. Um, it's 58. If I think if Bert had found that this is this is the map he was looking for, it was very hard to find a map of the region. You could he could find plenty of maps of Washington, plenty of maps of British Columbia, but straddling the border hard to find. Now this is uh this this one is kind of you know it, it well it's a couple things. It's got a line through the middle of it. It's also uh the water's kind of boring. Uh, it's focused more on the on the land and the and the human imprint. And it's clearly a piece of you know it's it's a it's, it's a sales map. It's trying to sell. It's propaganda. Um, it has a clear purpose, which is to say, as all maps do, it's, it's clear purpose is to get people on to, to ride the ferry. All maps have a purpose. All maps have an audience. Um, and so this map doesn't really work for 
for Bert, but I, I do love it because it's the oldest map I could find that basically captures the Salish Sea uh, as as an entity. Um, so um, Bert wanted a map. We wanted a map that would define and show the Salish Sea. Almost gets it out of this map, but beyond that, without a line through the middle of the ecosystem. So let's get rid of that border. And while we're at it, let's get rid of the roads, the cities, the place names, the human footprint. And let's focus on the water and the terrain and the ecosystem. And if we can get bathymetry, that'd be great. So that that sub sub water terrain. Uh, and again, you know, Bert had been looking at these. You know, this is what you find, and that's just not didn't cut it for him. And we don't, we don't you know, nope, 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 nope. But I don't want a line through the middle. Um, and so there's lots of maps out there, most of which have a line through the middle, most of which have some clear purpose, and none of which fit the the goal, which was again Bert's goal was I want to just be able to talk about the Sailor Sea. Uh, and, you know, and, and then my sub goal of that was let's treat this, you know, every map has a purpose. Let's get our map is mapped to the purpose where it, it's, it's propaganda. I want to make a map that is nice enough that people want to hang it on the wall and thus other people see the map. And thus we get to use the, the term of, I wanted to prompt that discussion. So propaganda in a good sense. Um, even when you get into, you know, land cover and, you know, so the more, uh, eco maps, uh, you still have that border at the uh, north and south. I mean, just like as though the eco region ends, uh, and you know, and this lovely trait of chopping the the waterway itself in half. Um, so none of those existed. Now, along the way, between the '80s and the 2000s, when I went to work, uh, there had been some other maps. Uh, so here's an Environment Canada map from '03, Sea Doc Society from '05 pretty much focused on the Salish Sea. We don't have a name for it yet. Um, Georgia Basin, Puget Sound kind of thing, um, but pretty much very similar to the same map. From Bert's standpoint, uh, the the water is still very boring here. It's it's clearly, you know, the, sort of an after effect. You know, the, the real focus of the land is the water, the labels, the, the jurisdictions, the political boundaries. And from my standpoint, not that these aren't perfectly good maps for the purpose, but I really felt we could do better. We we could we could we could aim a little higher. So um, so again, here's the basic was was here. Here's the map of the Salish Sea. Um, we want to introduce the name, and then from there, can we make it beautiful and can we make it appealing and uh, something you want to hang on your wall? Again, without a line through the middle and with a focus on the the, the natural systems as opposed to the human footprint. Well, one of the first ideas we had was um, let's just grab a satellite, and this is a was a uh, off-the-shelf product. It's almost the Sailor's Sea. Um, still has a line to the middle, but we can get the, the satellite imagery and make that same map without the line through it. Um, I think that's a pretty cool map. Uh, I've never really quite polished it up. I think it, 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 I kind of would like to have it on my wall, actually. But from Bert's standpoint, um, it's the, the human footprint was still too strong, and, it, and you can't not see the cities and the ag lands and the clearings in there. Um, I had this fantasy of, of redoing the recreating this map uh basically with photoshop and taking you know putting green where all the urban areas to make it uh, as though you had a satellite image from 1850 um i haven't i haven't had the time yet to do that um we talked about doing more of like kind of a watercolor and artsy and there's some historical this is an 1800 map of puget sound beautiful i love this the the the, the by hand another by hand uh this is elizabeth pearson uh five years ago uh again just gorgeous um, and even in with my limited uh, artistic skills in the computer and watercolor fills, you can get a pretty cool looking map. And that didn't seem quite right. So Bert was looking for something, you know, not quite so artsy as uh, a watercolor map, uh, but not quite so stark and harsh as the uh, satellite imagery. So what did he want? He wants this map. What's its purpose is to introduce and promote the name. The, the audience is very much twofold, both the locals, but also these naming boards, um, wants to have the water and the land, but not so much in the people. And this is what we came up with. Um, this is what I came up with, uh, over months of trial and error and trying and tweaking and da, 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 da. Um, and it was, and, uh, you know, pretty happy. Uh, it, this is easily my, um, 15 minutes of fame for what little I am, I will be known or remembered for this map is it. I've gotten more traffic and more, yeah, yeah anything. Uh, so that's great. Um, 2023, this last year, uh, I, I redid this map. Um, th this is, by the way, the world premiere. You all are, this is great. This, this, the talk was scheduled. And then I was like, I got to get this mapped up. Uh, anyway, so here's the, the 03 update. Um, slightly different, you know, little tweaks of the map. Um, 
kind of a different purpose. I, I don't have to sell it anymore. We won. It is the sale of sea. So now it's really more just an art piece that is what I want to look at on the wall uh, in terms of, of the Salish Sea and this place that I love. Largely the same map, surprisingly large amount of time went into recreating the same map, but um, um, both maps have fundamentally sort of, I think of it as four data layer, da da data pieces of data in there. You've got the land, salt water, the fresh water, and then this, this watershed bound boundary. Uh, in the original map that was 30, 30 or more GIS layers, so data layers in my geographic information system. The revised map, it's now ballooned over, over 45 for reasons that we won't go into. So the terrain um, is elevation. So this is elevation data that's readily available. Uh, and then I'm using a color ramp from dark green up through the browns to the white up at the top. Um, similar for the bathymetry, I've got this sort of blues getting deeper, darker as you go deeper. And in both of those, I put a, a, a shadow, a hill shade effect, or in the water, a floor shade effect, to give it this this sort of uh, shadow uh, terrain quality, as though it were three dimensional. And in terms of why the map was remade, here's why the map was remade. So look, this is the, the data has gotten way way better in the last decade. So here's here's what I had to work with in in 07, 08, and and here's what I've got now. That's I just love this and and. And it works at a, at a poster size, whereas the old map could just never really be posterized. It just didn't work. Um, so, so both the elevation and the bathymetry got way better in the the last decade. The freshwater, not a whole lot of change. Um, the lakes haven't moved around too much. That's a good thing. Um, the uh, the cartography changed a little bit. I've got a little bit be better techniques. Um, I also have now access to a, a snowpack layer that I didn't have in the in the early the first map. Which is to say, in the first map, I basically just said, above this elevation, it all becomes white. We're going to call it snow. And that's not really the case. Um, there's a lot more snow, the snowpack. Now, th this map, my, my new map, has got a snowpack. And you notice there's a lot more snow, which is to say year-round snow coverage, up in Canada than there is down in the in the, the Washington side um, because of uh, um, latitude. Okay, so the but the fresh water's there. Uh, and again... I think the new map pops a little better. I, I guess I'm liking that. I'm, I've become a little more 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 vibrant in the last decade. Um, the final thing, so that, that's the the elevation, the salt water, the fresh water, and the final kind of data theme theme I've got is the, the this basin boundary. So I've got this sort of, uh, and if you look at it up close, there's the area inside and the area outside has this sort of wash, uh, a, a white wash over it. Still have the terrain, still can see the hydro, but the colors are, are muted down so they don't pop. I'm trying to draw our focus onto the area of interest, which is the Salish Sea and that area immediately surrounding it. Okay, so that 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 basin boundary is a lot like a watershed, but it's not a watershed. So let's talk for just a moment about watersheds. Um, this map shows the full watershed of the Salish Sea, defined as all the water that drains into the Salish Sea from the various rivers and their tributaries. Um, very different than the map that I wanted to draw. So here's the here's the boundary that I used, uh, and here's the, the problem with that. And that is the Fraser River comes across this boundary. Um, but for the map we wanted to use, so if we that the full map here, this map here, the Salish Sea is actually only about five percent of the whole page. Um, this is the page that we wanted, and I wanted that that Salish to be Salish Sea itself. That's the focus of the map. Okay, so you can define, this is the watershed for the whole Salish Sea. This is the watershed for just the Fraser River. You can pull out even a tributary. This is the, say, the watershed for just the Thompson River, which drains into the Salish Sea, which drains into the Fraser, which drains into the Salish Sea. So you can pull out just the Fraser or just a trib of the Fraser. What you can't do is pull out the lower section of a river, all right? Short of diverting the whole Fraser River some other way or putting in a dam, that water comes through becomes part of the watershed. So it just doesn't work. You cannot, I cannot call that a watershed. All right. Um, and yet this is the map that I wanted to use. This is the focus, the story we wanted to tell. So I couldn't, if not a watershed, then what? And and other than that Fraser River, it, it basically does follow the watershed everywhere else. Right. Um, it's just that there's this one major violation of a huge amount of water. Um, so we call it the basin boundary. Um, we talked about a bunch of things, a catchment area, a drainage, a viewshed, a region, a bowl. Yeah, we came up with basin boundary. Um, 
there's some precedent there before us. Then the Georgia Basin, they've been talking about the Georgia Basin for decades, um, the Puget Sound boundary. Uh, so um, it seems to work. It's kind of a squishy term. It's not quite, uh, and, and here's the, and that earlier map, uh, that, that uh, 03 Environment Canada, they, they cut off, the Canadians cut off the north part of the river too. I felt like I was justified there. Um, so what's a basin? It's much more fuzzy. It, it could be a watershed, um, but it's much less scientific and much much more gray. And that I I used to. That's what I wanted. Um, there are other uses. There's a weather basin or a cultural basin. Uh, a radio station has its 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 uh, referred to the its its listener basis as a basin. So it was that kind of thing. And and what we were going for here was not just the hydrological watershed, but also the cultural watershed of the culture area. We wanted to capture that area that is has the maritime climate, has the maritime culture, um, is influenced by and influences the Salish Sea itself. Um, it's more or less, I, I like to think that if you walk that that brown line, you'd be able to see the Salish Sea. You're on the ridge line the whole way. And if you went over the ridge, you wouldn't be able to see it. And that's not quite true because we have tall trees and, and channel and hills and valleys that go up and down. But I like the idea that that's kind of the 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 line of anywhere on that line, you drop a marble, it rolls into the Salish Sea. And the only problem is that that one spot up there where the, the Fraser River has been truncated. Okay, so that's a long way to discussion about that, that, that basin boundary. Um, but it gets us the shape and the size of the map and the story that we wanted to tell where the Salish Sea is the dominant piece of, of geography on there. Text-wise, it's a weird map in that it doesn't have much in the way of text. Um, most maps have a lot more text, and we consciously didn't label the cities and the, the political jurisdictions. It's got some in you know, the North Arrow and the scale and the tick marks, whatever. Um, the only political uh, distinctions on there are Canada and U.S. on the locator map. And as the map has been downloaded, uh, I can track, you know, it, it was downloaded around the world. Um, uh, I felt like the locator map was important. So um, countries are, that, 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 that's as far as we were willing to go. So um, it all gets pushed together, mashed together in my GIS. Um, I was going for sort of a classic cartographic style, which is to say this sort of old North Arrow and these room lines, these lines radiating, radiating across the, the, the ocean there, the tick marks and the brown tones. Um, more or less uh, preserved that in the, the, the revised map, though uh, I think, like I said, I've become more vibrant in the last decade. Um, and uh, from a, a geeky, geeky GIS standpoint, real quickly, this it, it is, it is referred to as hip symmetric tinting. We should say the colors are based on elevation. It's not land, actual uh, land cover. Um, I'm choosing colors that, to me, sort of evoke the feel of the, the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's what's referred to as a Swiss hillshade effect that tries to get kind of the valleys be misty and the ridges be brighter. Um, a Swiss floor shade for the bathymetry. Sun highlights from the lakes, all trying to give it a little bit more of a organic life feel. Again, trying to capture what the area feels like to me out there. Um, all of that is sort of, again, worked at a piece of propaganda. I'm trying to make, I'm trying to sell something. The name Salish Sea. Um, early on, we started just handing these maps out and we quickly realized that we needed to tell the story with the map. And so we did a B-side that's got a very short version of this, this one hour talk. Um, again, part of the educational campaign, uh, uh, propaganda in a good way. Um, so Bert went out and printed literally thousands of these maps, handed them out to schools, museums, kids, Congress people. Um, thousands more have been printed uh, by a Western Sailor Sea Institute, the College of the Environment, myself. It's been downloaded hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, and and it worked um, that the name was officially adopted by the Coast Sailors Gathering, the Canada, WA, BC, um, USA. In 2009, we were the name of the year, uh, according to the New American Name Society. Um, 2008, it was Obama, so I felt like we were in good company. And uh, the runner-up the year that Sailor C was the name of the year was Twitter. So I felt great that we had beat out Twitter. Um, so um, it showed up on Google. We knew it really, really we, it succeeded when it, when it showed up on Google Maps. And that, I had a little party. Um, but it also showed up on uh, you know the nautical charts and the whale-watching boats and the, the record albums and books and conference names and reports and stewardship and on and on and on. Um, I used to kind of keep track of all the different papers and people and books that used my map and it just, it, 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 it wasn't possible. 
uh, turns out free is, is a real popular price. Um, and uh, that was the idea. Uh, we never charged for the map because it was the idea was to get that map out into the public and to promote the usage. Um, and I'm you know thrilled that the map played whatever small role it had in that adoption process and that it still shows up in reports. Uh, and you know even more so than the populated idea of the map, I'm thrilled that the name itself was that the effort was successful. Um, most recent uh, authoritative document that last year, two years ago, the State of the, Sa State of the Sailor Sea report came out. Um, huge effort. Lots and lots of authors went in there. The short answer is we still got plenty of work to do in terms of, uh, you know, all kinds of things, noise and estuaries. And so, uh, but at least we have a name, we can talk about it. Um, as I said, uh, updated just this, this last week, literally the last week, um, uh, largely the same map. Um, the big difference being this this improved data. There was some some errors that I didn't like and some things I wanted to change and some new geography, new, new cartography. And as I said, at this point, the map is made for my, this is the map that I wanted to make. And it, it, I no longer have to sell anything that, that you know, we, 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 we did it. We won. We got it. Um, it is the Sailor Sea. So now it's a statement as opposed to a proposal. Um, super quickly, and I'm running out of time, but that's okay. I want to talk about just a couple other maps uh, along the, on the line. The most interesting of the bunch is this map here. This is the Ish River country. Perhaps you've never heard of it, and yet uh, it's possible that we could be living could be living in what would be known as the Ish River country. Um, this was made 1987, so almost identically the same year that Bert was thinking about the Sailor Sea, David McCloskey et al. came up with this idea. There was a poem about the Ish River. And so you had the Samish, the Snohomish, all these Ish rivers that drain. Mostly they drain into the Puget Sound, but they were extrapolating, thinking big. Um, what's amazing to me is, and so look at the shape of my basin boundary, right? The, that's that the drains into the drainage, that drains into the Sailor Sea. There it is. Um, where did I get this map? I found it in a drawer in the building where I work. So the at Western Washington University, there's the map library and buried into some drawer in the cabinet, I stumbled across years after I was done with my map and you know, just completely floored. Like There it is. There's my map. There's, you know, pre-computer, um, black and white, hand-drawn, somehow, unbelievable. Just, uh, I love this map. Now, it's it's got to focus on the rivers, so it's sort of a compliment. And indeed, McCloskey et al. put out a map uh, a couple of years ago, the Ish River, Iliwit country, with the Salish Sea. So um, it, it, the Ish River never caught on, uh, at same time, time period. Um, and and uh, there was a bioregional conference in the 80s that uh, in Bellingham that David was at, and Bert didn't go to. So that I love that there was just, just barely missed this idea of these two names. Um, but I also love that the sail Ish C has the Ish River sound Ish right there in there as well. Um, so history, you know, uh, timing is everything. It, it could have been a good good idea either way you look at it. More recently, Jeff Clark up in Vancouver produced this map, the Essential Geography of the Sailor Sea. Uh, again, the same basic boundary I'm using. Phenomenal piece, beautiful. This is a poster you can buy. I encourage you to hang it on your wall. Um, uh, unbelievable amount of work. Uh, text, super text heavy. So this is more of a classic map. Um, well, I'd say, I'd say the bathymetry is a little dull, but that's you know, that's cartographic style. Um, what does he call it? The Sailor Sea bioregion boundary. So that same truncating of the north uh, northern part of uh, the upper Fraser River to get the focus on what we're talking about. Um, gorgeous piece of work. Dr. Aquila Flower up at Western um, at Al has been working on an atlas of the Salish Sea. This is uh, notable for a couple of things. Um, they're looking at this transborder. They're doing, these are digital, so it's not a paper print that you can print some of them as you want, um, and a series of maps. So they want to have not just the land, that, you know, not, not just a map, but the land ownership and the population and trying to harmonize data, census data from U.S. and Canada. And there's a piece of work. Aquila's got, uh, a, I, I joke that she has now a, a lifetime, she'll, she'll never run out of work. She's got plenty of, um, also a tip of that, that some of, she's putting some of the indigenous place names on the map, which uh, is um, a, 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 I love to see, a, so a worthy effort. Um, and why I phrase it that way, um, from the first moment I started working on the map, the most common suggestion, idea, uh, comment has been, hey, why don't we do that map? Can you do that map with the indigenous place names instead of 
uh, the Anglo. And uh, I think it's a fantastic idea and incredibly complicated. Um, here's three maps uh, that I did not do, um, illustrating some of that complexity of the overlapping uh, these indigenous, the, the indigenous cultures moved around and it commingled and the languages morphed and were similar or dissimilar. And so if you want to put the name of, oh, let's say, you know, Mount Baker or Comacolchen, there's probably four or five names and which name do you put on there? Um, and so, uh, I'm happy to make the map, but the work of deciding what names go on there is, um, can be quite controversial and not all tribal groups want their names on a map that a guy like me makes. And that's fine. Um, I think it's a worthy effort. And I think that there, there are people working towards it. I think it may be better as a web map where you could choose your language or see all of them or, 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 or I don't know, different ways of playing with it. Um, but, but again, no small piece of work there. Um, so this, this slide, I gave the talk, uh, I don't know, four years ago. And, uh, this is, so I sort of kept it and re re-edited this slide. Um, the four years ago, the main thing I wanted to do, I knew I had better data. I just wanted to sit down and get that new map done. And so thankfully I can cross that off. Uh, likewise, there was this long discussion of, um, let's do a series of maps, not just one, but Dr. Flowers got that. So I can cross that off the indigenous place names. Again, I think that's somebody else's, uh, somebody else's task, not mine. Um, I do still like the idea of making the, uh, far. Uh, satellite image, the, the 1850s satellite image of the Salish Sea. I think that'd be fun. I do think it'd be fun to make a series of maps uh, sort of more defining the Central Salish Sea. It's this transborder, the Southern Gulf and the San Juan Islands. Um, what do you call those besides the Southern Gulf and the San Juan Islands? And I think uh, a series of maps would help here, the, the Central Salish Sea. Um, so that's what I've been doing, uh, and that's what I'm, I'm up to. Uh, uh, Here's the, the new map, which you can download from maps.stephanfreeland.com slash Sailor C. Uh, and again, um, I just, you know, it's, I'm thrilled. Uh, I couldn't be, you know, happier to, you know, it, it was, it's the best thing that ever could have happened is to have Bert knock on my door and say, hey, could, could, he, could you do me this favor? Could I get you to, map, to, to make a map for me? I had no idea how many thousands of, th literally thousands of hours would go into it, um, but it's been fun. And, uh, and, and, and as I said, if it had any small contribution towards the adoption of the name, towards the better preservation of this place we call home, uh, great. So um, with that, I will uh, look and like, two minutes to spare. Uh, my apologies for uh, any long windedness, um, but we'll uh, talk yeah. it to the. There's, yeah, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, we uh, appreciate that was a, a fantastic uh, presentation there. Um, uh, this really enthusiastic, really informative. Um, we absolutely love it. Um, we're definitely getting some uh, praise and thanks in the chat. Uh, we will move now into a little bit of uh, question and answer. Um, so long as you're okay with it, we can overrun seven o'clock uh, at least by a little bit. Um, yeah. But uh, so yes, a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, um, for Stefan, please put those into the chat. We'll keep an eye on those. Uh, we'll get started with one that came in a little bit earlier on. Um, and I think this first one really speaks to all of the different ways that people have tried to conceptualize this region visually, um, with this question of, is this map to scale? It seems distorted, but maybe what I've been looking at in years past was distorted. No, nope, that, that's, that is as close to, I mean, that, According to my yeah 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 that that's that's a scale map uh, and uh, again we think of the most of us think of the Puget Sound as being quite large compared to Juan de Fuca Georgia and it's just tiny um, it, it 14 percent of the total sea uh, saltwater surface um, that's that's uh, I I also like playing uh, turn the map on uh, horizontal I should have put a slide in there um, I think it's it's um, or even upside down I think that. Again, we get so used to looking at our little part of the world that it's interesting. It, it looks different, um, depending on how you, you know, just, just removing the line through the middle changes the the perception of size. Because with the line through the middle, we look at our, our half and the Canadian side and kind of think they're the same. And they're not at all. Um, uh, Canada, Canada has, has much more water in the Salish Sea, more, much more skin in the game. But yeah, at scale. 
indeed that it can be like yeah so strange to uh to think about there um we'll also ask uh, another one here um towards the beginning you had talked about um kind of some of the motivating um ethics to try to adopt a unified name being conservation and preservation efforts um are there any um kind of results of the adoption of this name that you can speak of that um have yeah seen positive influence from um sure. the adoption it's, of it's, it's and it's it's very difficult to to to, to causality i mean because maybe we would have gone, gotten to those same you know, there's a lot of a lot of good work being done out there um you know up, up both sides of the border um we have you know the fact that we see seals and whales in bellingham bay when i was a kid we didn't see that you know I, i've been sailing the sailor sea for uh, over 40 years and we didn't have harbor seals because there weren't fish in in in, in abundance in bellingham bay the water is cleaner in many ways um, we still have work to be done. We're losing the orcas. Um, it's really hard to say that the Salish Sea name, yeah, you know, maybe let, let's hope that we would have been smart enough to to do any, any of the work we've done anyway. Um, and it's certainly not enough because we've gotten more work to be done. You know, our stewardship and the numbers keep growing. So, but yes, uh, you know, the fact that there are, you know, aquariums, you know, Salish Sea museums, there's, you know, it's it's a thing now in a way that it wasn't, um, and uh, I think that that cannot but help to have people in Victoria talking about the Salish Sea and people in Olympia talking about the Salish Sea, as opposed to we're protecting the Puget Sound and we're protecting the Strait of Georgia and we're protecting whatever. Um, I just think it has to help um, as a starting point. Sure, I, I think that totally makes sense. That yeah, you can't draw a direct line of. Uh, influence, uh, but even some of that anecdotal evidence is is really cool to see. Um, again, whether or not it's directly tied to this, um, we love to see the 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 wildlife and the nature of this area flourish. Um, on a bit more of a personal note, uh, would you be able to share kind of what drew, uh, drew you into cartography as a profession and a passion? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I stumbled into it. I've always loved maps. Uh, I was I was doing construction, put my my undergraduate degree in environmental ethics. Uh, building playgrounds, um, and I didn't want to be swinging a hammer, so I was thinking about going back to school. I was thinking about doing AutoCAD, and somebody said you had to check out GIS, and I, you know, I'm like, what is that? Um, literally stumbled into it, and uh, it turns out to be a, a software that works with my brain really well. Uh, I've never thought of myself as particularly artistic, so the idea of drawing that map, I don't have that skill set. Um, but how cool for uh, a not so artsy guy like me to be able to, by sort of dumb pers perseverance, uh, um, eventually produce what I, at least I like to look at on the wall, put on my fridge. Um, so, uh, and and the basic what draws me into GIS is it's got this mapping element, but it it has the G whiz of GIS is that you've got features lines. Here's a river, but it's not just a line. This is a river with some a database behind it. So it's a it's a mix mi mi mix up, mash up of geographic features. So this is a lake. What do we know about this lake? It's got this name, it's got this depth, it's got this water. Here's a river. And so the GIS allowed me to start doing analysis and cartography. And the cartography has always been, uh, uh, that that's my love. Uh, yeah, that, I'd love to do just that. Um, but uh, a lot of the, 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 the data editing and data collection and data analysis, uh, that's what most... GIS folk have to do with most of their hours. So I feel lucky to uh, that, I, that I was able to carve out a chunk of time and make them spend it on just making a map. Yeah, that is uh, this is super cool. I think that's something we uh, end up hearing a lot from uh, science communicators, especially is the artistic beauty that can really come from what is traditionally seen as very cold and calculated, hard numbers and everything. And yeah, the the map that you've created through this GIS work is an excellent example. We're getting lots of uh, praise for, yeah, both the the uh, aesthetic beauty, but then also how much information it does communicate. And yeah, look through the chat here. If there's any more encouragement you need to support the work of alternate versions or, um, you know, focusing in on uh, different elements of information that can be shared about this region, we've got a whole bunch of people supporting you here too. Um, 
I will say real quick, we are getting a lot of uh, requests for, hey, how can I get uh, my hands on a, a copy of this map, either digitally or in print? Um, we'll go ahead and post the link uh, to the website that Stefan has provided um, that has b both the versions of the, the Salish Sea map presented here, uh, as well as other um, kind of related maps uh, that he spoke to, um, which also include um, kind of ways to get a hold of it, again, both digital downloads um, and physical. Uh, Stefan, would you also be willing to either share the the presentation or the uh, the links for the kind of supporting information that you provided? Uh, yeah. If you're, if you're able to, you can provide that to uh, back to myself, um, and then we'll push that afterwards um, out to all of the attendees here, and then also post it to the uh, YouTube upload uh, once that gets finished. Yeah, and uh, again, yeah, you could download. It's a it's a two two sided PDF, um, eleven by seventeen. It's intended to, you want to find a uh, a high quality you know a, a print shop that can do eleven by seventeen and and a, a you know color laser uh, inkjet will fade. So you want to get a, a good printer. Um, and like I said, I'm working on trying to figure out a way that I could be sell you know just for cost sell sell those prints. Um, if you want a large a poster, uh, email me. You can you can find my I'm I'm on the website. Um, Ex the poster yet, but but uh, the Salish Sea Institute up on campus just printed uh, like a three by five version of this. And I can't wait to see it. Um, that you know that we can do that. That we we just never could pull off before. The other one just looked like a low resolution, uh, a bad a bad map if, when you blew it up very large. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, and yes, I, I'll, I'll I can give you some links. Uh, most of them are on that website already. But if you if you get to maps.stephenfreeland.com, you'll get you can get there to most of it. Sure. Hang on your wall. Much. Yeah, and again, you'll you'll find that link in the chat here, um, and we'll make sure it's included in the description of the YouTube upload afterwards. Um, let's see if there is anything else. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, another question here that kind of looks at uh, maybe broadening or continuing this work. Um, are you aware of any other areas in the world that could possibly benefit from a geographic renaming like with the Salish Sea? Um, yeah, geez. Um, yeah, it, it does come up. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the renamings, at least in the United States o over the last, it have been, you know, either a names, uh, that were offensive in one cultural sense or another, or, um, just sort of, uh, a reclaiming. Uh, so that, so the, the biggest renaming efforts that I've seen, you know, Haida Gwaii, Denali have been, um, sort of, a, a, a going back in time. Um, and, and a honoring of the indigenous cultures um, and or various slang terms that were derogatory to, to some place. Um, but but um, it seems like I just recently came across it was that, 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 that yes, that, that they are out there and I don't have them in the tip of my tongue um, that, you know, similar efforts. And um, I think, you know, the, the, the goal of sort of, um, you know, stewardship it drives a lot of that renaming i mean it's just sort of let's not be offensive that's a good good goal also but i think a lot of it um is aimed at you know let's get something that that everyone can 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 agree on kind of thing so um yeah it's not coming to mind but but that there are and and there's um it was yeah anyway no not 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 on top of my head if i find it like maybe we can stick into the into the the, the notes somewhere later on or i'll add it to my web page yeah, not a problem at all. Uh, you recognize we're we're stretching the bounds of uh, what you're thinking on right now, but uh, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, I think if nothing else, this can give folks inspiration when they're looking at maps or when they're traveling uh, to see, hey, wh why does this name exist? Clearly, it came from somewhere. Um, you know, that just pops that it, thought. Folks and, yeah, that that makes me think. You know, the when I we first posted it up, like I I, I did I tracked like who was downloading the maps. And it was being downloaded literally around the world, um, you know, people in Europe and people in Asia. And um, I don't know how they were finding it, um, but but you know, we don't have very many new names. It's kind of a, a big deal to have a, a new C. And so I think it got picked up various places and various threads. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was a success, a success story. Uh, it took a little while, but but we got there. Um, so that was kind of cool. It was, it was exciting to see that that. It spoke to something to, to, to people uh, around the world. And some of it was, you know, Western Washington University alumni, 
Um, but some of it wasn't, and I could, you know, like I never could figure out, and uh, you know, how how they were finding my map to download it. But it was great. Um, so, yeah. And that is super cool. Uh, let's see. Gonna take a quick moment here. Uh, we will go ahead and uh, wrap up for the evening. I think we've gotten through um, all of our questions. Uh, we're still getting a couple of thanks coming through. Uh, but thank you very much, um, Stefan, for spending the time with us this evening. Um, I think this was a fantastic pres uh, presentation that our communities uh, really benefit from. And thank you, everyone who did uh, sign on to uh, listen in. Uh, this does conclude our presentation for the evening. Uh, we encourage you to check back at the Snow Isle website, uh, both for the upload of this recording, but also for more online events, including the 2023 Annular Solar Eclipse with Robert Scott on August 27th, and Understanding Israel Past and Present with Professor Nancy Koppelman on September 28th. Do have a good night, everyone. Hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much.